confirmation class on, let's see, what night was that? Wednesday night. Right here in this very room, because our students were studying worship. And um, there's so many components of worship. The furnishings, the things that we understand about the sacraments, um, what we do when we come together in this space, or um, when we set apart time to worship God. And some of the questions, and every time um, I teach the confirmation students about worship, and one of the parents or mentors are there, they always have such really wonderful questions. It reminds me um, that we don't know as much as maybe we ought to know as a church about why we do what we do and how we celebrate as a church. And so, with it being back to school time, I'm going to encourage you to pull out a pencil and your bulletin, and maybe you want to take some notes today. Um, today is just a little bit of a primer um, on getting back to school, but I am going to do a series, and I'm probably going to start this Sunday, but then we'll skip the week that we're down at, at the lake. Perhaps I'll even talk about sacraments next Sunday so that when we go to the lake we'll understand more about baptism. Um, but I'm going to do a series, and it's going to be more um, teaching than it is preaching, um, because I realized um, if I'm going to retire in June, there's some things that I think you need to know that maybe I haven't taught you. So I'm going to try to catch us up a little bit, and so maybe we'll have like an adult confirmation. Um, was it help? Who was here adult-wise um, here for confirmation? Did you learn anything new about worship? <coughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so I think it behooves all of us to go back and talk about, for example, how many sacraments do we celebrate in the Methodist Church? Anybody know? Three? What are they, Beth? <laughs> Communion's one of them. Beth, this was the other one. What's the third one, Beth? I don't know. Because there's only two. <laughs> it was a trick question. <laughs> it must be pick on Beth Day. You only pick on the ones you love. <laughs> um, so today, uh, with it being back to school time, uh, we're going to talk about our ABCs and our one, two, threes. Um, so our scripture lessons, though, first uh, from Luke. And we're, you might want to keep your Bible out because we're going to be flipping around a lot today. Luke chapter 2, very familiar story about Jesus. Um, we know about Jesus' birth. Um, we know about when he was about two years old um, and the wise men found him. And then we don't know anything in between about Jesus' life. Um, we think maybe he was, who knows what he did as a boy um, until he's 11 years old. And this is the story that we find. Um, chapter 2, verses 41 through 52, if you haven't found it already. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. Oh, it was 12. Sorry, I said 11. When he was 12 years old, they went to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, his parents were returning home. For, for a second, back up, because this is the way my mind works. How old is Gray? 12. 12. So I'm trying to think of kids that we know that are 12 years old. So Gray's age. All right? So if that's helpful. Um, he would get lost. He would get lost. I thought, he, I thought you were with your daddy. I thought you were with your mama. Yeah. Um, so when he was 12 years old, they went to the feast according to the custom. And after the feast, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But the parents weren't aware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. And after three days, they found, them, found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? Jesus answered. Didn't you know that I'd be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he was saying to them. Then he went to, Jer to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. 
But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. And then if you would turn with me to uh, Hebrews chapter 10, beginning with verse 22. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, thank you and praise you. Uh, you are worthy of our honor, glory, and praise. And we thank you for the gift of your word. And we thank you for the stories of Jesus. And Lord, we know the more we learn every day, the more we realize that we don't know. And so, Lord, teach us, because we have so much to learn from you to make us more and more faithful as men and women and young people for Christ Jesus. So touch us as we contemplate your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So just a quick word about the story, um, the stories that we read, uh, Jesus at 12 years old. So... Greg would be, you You and Charlie would probably be like, oh, he's probably off with some boys. They found a stick in a rock and they're playing baseball. You know, that version. Um, three days. How many, did you remember that it was three days that they were missing? Um, I remember uh, when I was young, when I was still single, single, one of my very good friends adopted a little girl. And uh, when she was a toddler, she thought it was the most fun thing um, when you were in a clothing store in those racks, those round racks that have clothes hanging all the way around. She thought it was the most fun thing to get in the middle of the racks and hide. And it would make me, and her mother would let her get by with it. You ever see people that let their children get by with stuff that you would so tan their little honey for? I said honey right there in the middle of the sermon. Um, and on YouTube. Um, oh my goodness, it used to make me so mad because it wasn't that I was mad at her for being a child. It was I was mad at her because she scared the life out of me because for even just a few seconds, I didn't know where she was. And um, it would make me so, so scared um, because you hear of people losing their children and, and then being kidnapped in shopping areas especially. Um, and it only takes a second. They're, they're sneaky little creatures, those children. Um, and it's part of what makes them wonderful, um, that they have adventurous spirits and they want to learn and they want to play games and they want to hide. That's part of what makes them wonderful, but part of what scares us the most um, about them. Because the moment that you realize that they're not where you think they are, <gasps> extreme panic. Um, Jesus is so amazed uh, as even a 12-year-old boy. Why, why wouldn't you know where I was? I mean, do you remember the birthing story? You can almost hear Jesus saying, remember, I'm special. Um, there's stuff I've got to get busy about. And the thing that is always such a blessing to me when I read the story is that it wasn't Jesus asking questions of the synagogue leaders. It was the synagogue leaders asking questions of Jesus. The 12-year-old was the teacher. The student becomes the teacher, and he's already so full of wisdom and knowledge, um, truly because he was truly human, and he was truly divine all at the same time. And even as a 12-year-old, how very important the gift of wisdom and knowledge were to him, that he knew that, and he was surprised that those who loved him didn't know that. And so how very important for us to realize and value Wisdom and knowledge is gifts from God and something to be sought after. Quickly also to the Hebrews passage. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Um, how important as we bunch up. What a great illustration today, Andrew. Put that in your book. That's a really good one. Um, as we bunch up together today, how important to acknowledge that we must be remain, remain connected to the vine. That we must remain connected to Jesus, but not by ourselves. We're not meant to be solitary bananas. 
We are meant to be connected to one another. That's how God has made us, that we are meant to be a part of the body because when one of the members of the body is affected, the whole entire body is affected. When one of us grieves, all of us grieve. When we hear stories of storms, we're all, even if we don't know anybody personally that might be in the path of the storm, how many of you pray that the storm turns and goes out to sea? Yeah. When we heard news yesterday of yet another mass shooting in Texas, I don't know any of those people, but how many of us began praying for him? It's connected not just to the people that we share space with directly, not just people that we know, but when we are part of the body of Christ, we are connected to one another in a way that binds us, that is deeper than um, just knowledge of a person's face or a person's personality. It's knowledge of a person who's part of your body. So, ABCs and one, two, threes of faith that, um, that I want us to remember um, for right now. So, on your piece of paper, um, A. The letter A. So for me, A today is the word abide. Abide. It's an old word. Um, anybody know um, a song, an old hymn with the word abide? Andy, is there a, word, a hymn with the word abide in it? Abide with me. Abide with me. Um, and I remember a chorus I remember, abiding in you. I only want to be abiding in you. Um, I didn't even know what a body meant when I first learned the hymn, but I, I then learned as I grew on how important it is to abide. What does it mean to abide? I'll give it to you from the perspective of one of our youth in confirmation. I said to um, Nathan McSparrow the other night, I said, Nathan, what are you doing for your last week of school? He said, just hanging. <laughs> yeah, that's abiding. <clears throat> just hanging. Uh, but this, in this situation, we are abiding in the presence of the Lord. So next to the word abide, you might want to write down 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning with verse 16. You know this, and you can sing it. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Give thanks when? Always, in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Pray without ceasing is the version that some of us have learned. I don't know if that's King James' version. Pray without ceasing. What in the heck does it mean to pray without ceasing? Like, you, you might say, when do you pray? Tell me, when do you pray? Who prays first thing in the morning with your devotions, maybe? Um, who prays at meals? Yeah. Um, who prays um, in the evenings before you go to bed? Who prays sometime in between? Who prays times throughout the day when you don't even really realize you're having to, supposed to be praying? Yeah, everybody. Even if you go, oh my Lord. Prayer. Think about it, so be careful where you use that. Um, pray without ceasing doesn't mean to necessarily hit your knees, because when I first read this scripture when I was younger, I was like, who can pray without ceasing? I mean, there are some people who are called to a monastic life, but even they have to stop and eat, or even they have to stop and go tend the garden, or, or change their underwear, you know, everybody's got to stop every now and then and do some work. What does it mean to pray without ceasing? Here's what I think it means in a nutshell. Do everything that you do as if you were doing it so, um, I remember when I was thinking about this scripture a lot, um, I was working at the Hermitage, and God kept bringing this pray without ceasing, and I'm like, I'm going to try to have more prayer in my life. And so, one of the things that I started doing, which was just a simple thing, it was a healthy thing to do as well as a, a spiritual thing, is that instead of taking the elevator, I decided I was going to always take the stairs, and when I was taking the stairs, it was going to be prayer times. Um, or a lot of times I'd have to, part of my job had me running errands back and forth for different residents in the home. And so I found that while I was running back and forth, um, running their errands, I prayed for them. Um, and so um, praying without ceasing, uh, do everything that you do as unto God. Abide, that's your A to your ABCs. B, this one, how many times have you been told to Behave. Behave. I tell it to every age. It's not just for kids. We're going to turn to Philippians. 
um, chapter 4 and stay there because we're going to do a couple different pieces from Philippians chapter 4. Um, you know this one, you can sing this one also, um, beginning with verse 4. So this is Philippians 4, 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. You know how I've said to you, if you're going to put um, blessings on your license plate like I have on mine, or if you're going to put one of those fish on the back of your, cro of your car, or anybody wearing a cross today, cross necklace, I put my cross necklace on, um, you better behave, because whatever you do, whatever you say, even if you drive really bad and you got that fish on the back of your car, that's a witness for the Lord. Hopefully, the witness that you're going to offer is a good witness. It's not just when you have that fish on the back of your car, though. It's not just when you have that cross around your neck or hanging off of your earrings, those of you men who wear earrings with the cross hanging off of them, or the big Jesus Loves Me t-shirts. Um, it's not just when you're wearing those outward and visible signs of faithfulness. It's everywhere you go because guess what? They are watching. And so remember that whatever you do, whomever you are with, you are a witness to Jesus Christ. So you should behave as though Christ first, as though Christ were in the room or your mama. <laughs> Behave as though you wouldn't be embarrassed caught doing whatever you're doing. You know what it means to behave, and you know what it means not to. You know when you've slipped. You know when you've gone places that you shouldn't have gone. You know when you've said things you wish, as soon as it fell out of your mouth, that you had caught it in the brain filter, that it slipped right through. Um, you know when you have thought a thought that wouldn't be pleasing to God. You know all of those things, and so correct yourself. And grow and receive forgiveness for those things and move on. I remember hearing somebody, a preacher, cuss one time and he said, Well, thank goodness that's out of my mouth. Ugh. Hopefully I don't have to keep that in there. Um, so um, once it comes out of your mouth, don't let it go back in, all right? Um, because what you say and what you do is a witness of who you are. And you always want your witness to be a witness for Jesus Christ. Behave, that's your be. C. I couldn't figure out how to say this um, without putting two words in. Contemplate contentment. Contentment is really the word. Contentment. Underline contentment. That's your C. And for that, we're still in Philippians chapter 4, beginning with 11b. This is Paul, who often tells us how much trouble he's in, how uncomfortable he is, what he's been through, and, and his witness usually begins with, I used to persecute the Christians, thought I was doing the right thing. That's how his witness often begins. And then he goes on to say how Jesus got a hold of him. Um, it was a blinding experience for him at first, but then his eyes were opened anew. 11b, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do, say it with me, all things through Christ who gives me strength. Say it again. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. How many Days and hours are taken off of our life by worry or by focusing on being stuck somewhere or by the situation that we're in. Um, sometimes we are in very, very...
very difficult situations, but God doesn't want us to be stuck in those places. I'm not saying be content with what you have and don't try to get out of it. I'm saying that no matter what happens, model your life and live your life in such a way that no matter what happens to you, you can say, it is well with my soul. No matter if um, somebody that I love very dearly has suddenly died. No matter if my house caught fire and all of my treasures were burned. No matter if my child has gone off and forgotten about me for a while and they're doing wild things out of my control. No matter, God cares about those and you can think about those. But don't wish yourself out of the situation you're in because you're in it. Instead, be content with where you are and know that God is going to bring you carry through it all. Right? That God will bring you through it all. Right, Andy? Yes. Right, Brenda? Yeah. That God will get you through whatever your situation is. So be content. Contemplate contentment. Think about it. Think about it. Instead of thinking about, oh, I'm in such a bad place. I hate my life. Life is terrible. Life is not terrible. Life is a wonderful gift. Look at how God's going to bring you through it and what your testimony is going to be. Contemplate contentment. A, B, C's. Abide, behave, be content. Find contentment. Practice contentment in your life. A, B, C. One, two, threes are easy. You already know these. Number one, love God. Number two, love one another. Number three, that is all. <laughs> Write it down. Number one, love God. Number two, love one another. Number three, that is all. If you love God and you love one another, you don't have to worry about the rest. God will take care of the rest. A, B, C, abide, behave, contemplate contentment. One, two, three, love God, love one another. That is all. Let us pray. God, thank you for being our all in all. Thank you for offering yourself to us over and over again. Thank you for simple ways to learn about your love and the things that you call us to. Let us practice our lives according to your plans, to abide in your presence and to know that um, no matter what happens, you are there with us and to pray without ceasing, to know that um, you call us to live a life um, that is constantly referring to you whether intentionally focusing on adding more prayer to our lives or whether just living our lives in such a way that we want to honor you in everything that we do. God, behaving, rejoicing always and knowing that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, consciously <coughs> contentment, knowing that wherever we are, whatever is going on, you are there with us. One, two, three, love you, love one another. We thank you, God, that you have loved us in such a way that you would give yourself to pay the price for the sins that we have committed against you by thought <coughs> and deed. And so as we prepare to come to your table, Lord, we remember that you have called all to this table who long to live in harmony and love with you and with one another. And Lord, in order to be in harmony with you and with one another, we confess our sins before you. Hear our sins as we offer them to you, Almighty God. Forgive us. We thank you, God, that you are the same God yesterday, today, and forever, and that you're property, your, your personality, your love, and your life is to always have mercy. Thank you for having mercy upon us. Forgive us of our sins. And we receive in the name of Jesus Christ that we are forgiven. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. We praise you. Bless us now as we come to your table. It is always a joy to gather together as the body of Christ. But how wonderful every time we get to come to this holy table to celebrate this sacrament. 
this means of God's grace among us. This is a loaf of Hawaiian bread. We love Hawaiian bread. How many of you ever had Hawaiian bread before communion? Remember the days when we used to use pita bread for communion? Well, it doesn't matter what bread it is. This loaf of bread, Pat Brown went out and bought probably from the food line, and this is Welch's grape juice that she probably bought from the food line too. But when we ask God's blessing upon it, it becomes a means of grace. It becomes a way that we experience Christ because we remember. We remember the night when Jesus met with his disciples. And when he said to them, I long to share this feast with you. And then when he broke the bread and he gave it to them and he said, Eat from this all of you, for this is my body which is given for you. Every time you eat of this bread, remember me. After the supper, Jesus took the cup was one of many cups of wine served as part of the Passover feast, but Jesus appropriated this one when he, he blessed it. And he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant, a new promise from God. My blood poured out for the sins of many, Jesus said. Whenever you drink of this cup, remember me. Let us pray. Almighty God, you are a God of grace. You are a God of mercy. You are a great, big, amazing, awesome God, and we're so thankful for you. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here at this table as we remember and as we celebrate who you are and as we celebrate the privilege and the honor of knowing that you have allowed us to come as your people to this table. So pour out your spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that they might be for us the body and the blood of Jesus Christ broken and poured out, and that we might be for the world the love and the presence of Jesus Christ. Almighty God, there are so many things going on in our world and so many concerns on the headlines over and over again. For those we do pray in the, in the line of the storm, God, we pray for that tremendous force of nature to wash out to sea. We pray your blessings upon any in the path of the storm, that they would be wise in making preparations. And God, we just pray for all people who face disasters of any kind, for tremendous loss, for tremendous danger. Life has never been promised to be easy, without risk, but life is promised to us through Jesus Christ. And you have promised that no matter what, you will be with us to the very end of the age. And God, for those who have suffered in the midst of terrible acts of violence, for those who have lost loved ones and those whose health have, have been compromised because of a move of hatred and, and longing for power, God, we ask for your blessings. And we ask for some cease and halt to the hatred that's in this world, God. And we know the truth. The truth of the matter is that hatred cannot exist in the presence of love. And so, God, help us to pour love upon the world and upon everyone that we meet. Thank you, Jesus. God, I thank you for the life of this church and congregation. I thank you for our children and our youth and our adults of all ages. God, that we might be busy about your business. And God, in the midst of um, getting ready to begin a new year in ministry and contemplating um, new budgets and new personnel and all the things that we're working on as administrative tasks in the life of our church, we pray that you would bless us and guide us and use us, God. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Now bless us as we return to this table forgiven and loved as we receive these tokens of bread and wine, body and blood broken and spilt. Let this sacrament nourish our hearts. We ask all of this now in the very strong name of Jesus Christ who has to pray. Our Father, who 
art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us to say our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Because there is one love, we who are many are one body. When we break the bread, it is sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. My dear friends, these are the good gifts of God for us, the people of God. Together now, let us celebrate. 